This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages and growing. Now, please enjoy this message. See, see, the gospel turns most of the ways we think 180. Like a lot of Christians are using their faith to get green lights. Like, they call that favor. He's like, let the light be red. <laughs> Most Christians are using their faith for nobody in the line at the grocery store. He said, get in the biggest one. <laughs> see, how, see how the gospel changes things? <laughs> it's pretty cool. So, uh, wow. Hey, that first session, you guys were here, right? When Todd was sharing? I was pretty happy about that. I was like, that was really solid. I felt like we could have just all went home and just walked in love for the rest of our lives and stayed free. <laughs> just figured we could have been done. So we had this phrase for years where we would preach. We'd, whoever would go first, the other one would always say, dude, you said everything there is to say. What, what am I? <laughs> I used to say to Todd, because he'd always go over time, and I'd say, you just taught everything Jesus ever told you. <laughs> but that's how it felt this morning. Was that solid or what? See, you know when you're hearing the gospel, when your heart's encouraged and it's bringing life, Grace is an empowerment. Grace isn't an excuse slip. Grace is God's working ability on your behalf. You're saved by grace through faith. When you put faith in the truth and you trust what he said through what he did, grace comes to make that truth your reality without you biting your lip to change. That's how grace works. That's you being with him and your heart starts to see and you begin to get these knowings in your in your life, where you just know. Paul writes about it. John writes about it. You can look up in the scripture many places, and you, you see in knowing and coming to know, and we've come to know and believe. It's all through your Bible. So it's just a real big deal. Uh, the strength of this morning, and I feel it's in my heart. I'm just going to kind of camp there a little bit. I'm just glad you guys are here, and you guys seem excited. Like, yeah, yeah you really do. It's, it's, it's fun. Like, I know Todd experiences this everywhere he goes. I'm, I, uh, I'm a little more stealthy. I'm kind of, I don't advertise my schedule. I go into some smaller churches. If I advertise, we'd probably run into trouble. I wouldn't be able to do what I feel called to do. But uh, everybody's always excited. And I'm thinking this message we're preaching, it, it, it calls for change. Like it's, it's telling us who we are so we can live in what he paid for. So it's not like a bless you, fill your vats and barn kind of message. It's like get your heart transformed and and live in the spirit and walk like Jesus walked. Amen. And yet people, yeah, people are like, yeah, like, like you just, yeah. And, and I'm like, this is awesome. So it just excites me because that's kind of all we know to preach because he changed. When he changes your life, then you just share that message. Like, like I never read my Bible to preach a sermon, but I never feel unprepared. Like I've never read my Bible to preach. I've always read my Bible to know him. And when you get to know him, then you live your life in him, and then you have a lot to talk about. So it's never just theological. It's actually really real, and it has a grace and an anointing to impart into hearts. And if you preach what you see, it causes other eyes to go, oh, and see. So I'm excited about it. So I'm just going to preach something I've been living really for 23 years. You hear Todd saying, you know, about no guilt, condemnation, shame. Some people have a hard time relating to that because they almost go through that all the time. And it's never a place for guilt, condemnation, and shame in a born-again believer's life. See, even if, you, even, if you, even if you slip up, we're not talking about even perfection here, and we're not making an excuse to just slip and fall. What we're saying is, even if you do slip and fall into something, the fact that you care now, I don't think we make enough of this. We, we, a lot of people just think you should be broken and crying for two days to show you're serious. It never produces anything good. You camp there long enough, it'll, it'll mess you up. The fact that you care about what you used to not care about means you've changed on the inside. Like you couldn't even be guilty, condemned, or ashamed if you weren't alive inside. Like those things, they're perverse. They're a perverse way of responding, but they wouldn't have nowhere to land if you weren't pure on the inside. Like if you didn't care, you wouldn't care. This isn't complicated. Like you couldn't be condemned if you didn't care. But condemnation is never the answer. 
So you gotta get a hold of truth and keep going after him and truth makes you free. So I just wanna encourage you that guilt, condemnation, and shame are, are lies from the devil. There are three major tools of hell and they're never the kingdom of God. Never the kingdom of God. God doesn't use them ever at any level. They're all anti-finished works of the cross and they never produce life. Are you with me? I feel, I feel most stern in that, only I f I'm smiling, but I, I can't say it's serious enough. They're anti-finished works of the cross. Guilt, condemnation, and shame. And I've pastored for a while, I've been a Christian for a little bit, been around a lot of folks for a lot of times, and there are three major things that seem to be in people's lives on a regular basis, and it doesn't ever have to be. You're never Adam hiding from God again. He took off the things Adam made to try to cover his mistakes. You can't cover yourself. He clothes you in righteousness. You got to understand that you never do what Adam and Eve did. In 1 John 2, it says, brother, I write these things so you do not sin. It doesn't say, but when you do, it says, if you do. We ought to notice these words because most of us are expecting to. It doesn't say when you do, it says if you do. That's pretty awesome. And he's not preaching perfection there. What, what, what you wanna do is you wanna let grace take you where it's possible to go. And if you believe things about yourself based on yourself, you might miss the grace that changes you. Like if you weigh human experience above the working power of God, you might stay the same and just have a confession. We have so lorded where we've all been. We, we don't do it on purpose. It's just, we believe what we've lived is who we are. And he's saying none of that is, has anything to do with who you are. That's why he calls it all dead. That's why you have to die if you're ever going to live in Christ. You have to die. So it takes away everything you've been. Why are we studying our human experience and past practice so heavily why are we following our own human experience when we're called to follow him? Why do we say stuff like, well, yeah, but you know how we, well, yeah, but nobody's gonna, but yeah, we're always, and we've kind of created a language through the way it's been in our life's experience, and Jesus through the cross is saying, what are you talking about? Like, that's supposed to be everything dead. It should die in your language, too. Like, if you wake up and expect to fail, no wonder you fail, because you think you're a failure. If you wake up and expect to sin, you think it's holy to and humble to wake up and say, okay, look, we're all sinners. Thank God he considers us. I'll just do the best I can today. It doesn't bring glory to God. That's why people are messing up all the time. What they think they are is what they produce. If you wake up and believe you're a son, your life will start looking like sonship. If you actually wake up and believe you're right in the sight of God, guilt and condemnation and shame don't have a landing strip on your soul. It can never come in. Like if you understand you're clean and you're holy and you're blameless and you're above reproach, not because we're arrogant and we're speaking vanity, because we read our Bibles. We read our Bibles. And he said, this is where I've placed you through my finished work. If, if, if we would ever just get this, that if he says, I forgive you through the blood, then be forgiven, period. Like, period. If he says, you're right in my sight, I love you, be love, be right in his sight, period. There is no yell but, there's no well I feel, but you don't know where I've been, but you don't know my background. It's irrelevant. He knows everything, and he came, and he washed it all away. And, 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 and I love the, the fact that you guys are so excited about this, and you can talk so freely. I would talk this freely if you weren't excited. I just would. I, people need this truth. It's, it's truth that makes free. And even if people say to me, like, they say, do you ever get in atmospheres where you feel resistance? stuff? I said, I don't even pay attention to that stuff. Resistance. What's resistance? If Jesus paid attention to resistance, come on. He, he's amazing. And, and he just lived 
that life that he preached and he modeled it for us and he invited us in to follow him. And now he sits at the right hand. He's serious. Like he sits at the right hand of God mediating on our behalf through the blood of Jesus that's on the mercy seat. Like that's exciting. I want to look at that more than my ability to fail. I want grace to save me. I want grace to change me. Not enable me to stay the same, change me. It's, it's not, it's not, this is not grace. Boy, I really blew up on my spouse today. Thank God for his grace. No, his grace keeps you from blowing up. His grace isn't there to excuse you when you mess up. It's there to empower you when you see truth. Are you with me? Come on, guys, we can live this life or he wouldn't call us to it. I found this in 2 Peter 1. It's there. And, and you know what's cool? If I turn there, it's still there. You better get childlike with me. You better get simple. Or life's going to start speaking a little louder than truth in your soul. And all of a sudden, you'll believe you're not free. All of a sudden, you'll let something matter more over what matters most. All of a sudden, you won't be seeking first the kingdom. You'll be seeking your own well-being, your own feelings, your own... <sighs> yeah? Be careful with that stuff. Now, I found this in 2 Peter. It says, you have exceedingly, you all, I, everybody, we have exceedingly great and precious promises by which, meaning through these promises, we partake of his divine nature. <laughs> What's he saying? I have assured through my word that you'll receive everything necessary to be transformed to become one with me divine nature, where I'm not just going to give you a theology of positional right standing. I'm going to put who I am on the inside of you through the person of Holy Spirit. Exceedingly great and precious promises by which you partake of his divine nature. Watch. Having escaped, remember out of darkness, into light, remember Acts, delivered from the power of Satan to the power of God, right? by which uh, uh, you partake of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. The word lust there has nothing to do with pornography. It has to do with self-centered desire. So self-centered desire and his divine nature are totally contrasted. You can't be a Christian for your sake. Messed up, never work. No wonder people are miserable going to church if they're a Christian for their sake. Discouraged people show up for services all the time. And it's a dead giveaway that life is deciding who they are, not the life in them. And it doesn't mean they're evil. It doesn't mean they're hypocrites. It doesn't even mean they're mean or mad or, or bad. I'm not saying a bad thing. I'm saying we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And in all you're getting, get understanding. I, I, I don't believe this is impossible. I don't believe it's too big of a task for God. I believe there could be such a pouring out of truth on the earth that people could show up Sundays to gather together and really be excited to celebrate him together and stir each other in love and good works and break like a football huddle and just go back out from where they came and look a little more like him than when they got there. Instead of walking in with a sad face because you didn't get the rent paid or walking in with a sad face because of something and, and you're drawing attention to yourself through your countenance and all of a sudden you're reduced to the highest grace you're receiving is that it seems like somebody cares. That's just this way, man. Get out of that rat race. Somebody cares. Yeah? You don't, you don't ever have to do that. The rent might not be paid, but you still woke up with the same purpose. Christ is still in you. He's still the hope of glory. Is this thing contingent on everything you're hoping to happen, or is he just Lord? Come hell, come high water, do you shine? Do you walk like he walked? Do you follow him, or do you just cry out to him? Come on, guys. Just, just if the gospel could do this little uh, in your motives, oh my goodness. Wouldn't it be amazing if people didn't know how to be discouraged and we actually believed it was possible? 
See, a lot of teachers won't tell you this is possible. They say, that's over preaching. You're in denial. That's an extreme. Everybody's going to have their moments, brother. That thing's out of bounds. We're all this way. No, we've studied a fallen man. We've bought in and said, this is us. He told us to be born again. Brand new creatures. Put off the old. Put on the new. Come on, if he can change my mind, my eye, through changing my heart, he surely changed my whole life. Wouldn't it be amazing to gather together with no discouragement in the room, and if somebody did show up that way, we'd sniff it out and encourage them and get that root out that lie? What, what Todd and I, Todd kept referring to our talk this morning, we were just talking about people being ministry crazy. They always think prayer is the answer. Prayer is very important. Make no mistake about it. But when you look at prayer in a personal level, it's usually prayers of committal, giving yourself intimacy, communion, communion, prayers of supplication, and prayers for all the saints and for leaders and authority. The primary prayer we pray is needs driven. It's everything I need, everything I want, everything I fear. So we're feeling a certain way and we say, I think I need prayer. Hey, can you pray? Can you just pray this thing off of me? It's not a thing praying a thing off of you. It's getting something out of your belief system. Stop and relating to the moment and the experience into the feeling. Because if you just live out of your feelings, you're just a feeling away from another day. So then we get reduced to believing if I don't feel different, I'm not free, so we keep going after the same kind of ministry. That's what Todd was trying to explain this morning. And all of a sudden, we're doing the person injustice. We just need to tell people who they really are. You don't need prayer most of the time in those situations like we think. People say, you wake up in the morning, okay, watch. You wake up in the morning, it happens to people. I've gotten these phone calls over the years and I'm not making fun of anybody, I wanna expose something so you just never find yourself here. The alarm clock's bleeping, you were restless, it wasn't seeking Jesus like Todd woke up seven times. Some of us rolled a little, all of a sudden it was 2.30 and you had to pee and you were like, oh, now I'm up. And you laid there for 40 minutes trying to fight it off and ignore it. And now at 20 of three, you finally get out of bed. And you went to the bathroom and you got back and you looked at the clock and thought, ooh, got a little more time before that alarm. And then at six o'clock, I really don't like that scene. I just like to be woken up by the Lord. But some people choose that road and, and then they're like, oh, and I get it all. And then you torture yourself and you hit snooze. You torture yourself, you just feed your flesh, you just fuel your flesh. For nine minutes, you get yourself to actually believe this is a good thing. You sleep for nine minutes. Nine minutes goes by, me, 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 me. And if you're really fleshy, you'll just hit it one more time. And then you finally, finally, finally muster up the ability to get out of bed. And you're, and you're just heading to the bathroom. And all of a sudden you say, oh man, Oh man, I feel like, oh man, I felt, oh, I know this feeling. I felt this way two weeks ago. It was the worst day of my life. I barely made it. Through. And he said, I need prayer. It's amazing how we're geared. I need prayer. I need prayer. I need prayer. I need prayer. You probably don't. You probably need communion and relationship with Holy Spirit. He's. He's standing there waiting to be with you, <laughs> and you're calling your friend to get him, and he's like, and you're, and he's right here. <laughs> what, what, what is? What is, I'm not being mean, I'm not being sarcastic, don't leave, watch. I'm not being mean when I say it this way, it's just the way I hear it. What is so difficult about believing he's there and, and teaching your heart that that's true? What's so difficult about just not calling anybody in that moment? Because that's all feeling driven. Man, if you're gonna be feeling driven, I promise you feelings are never gonna be good in your life. I'm full of feelings, but they're actually amazing. They don't hinder me. They're not at the cost of anybody. I'm passionate. I'm a raging. Half the time I have to tone down to communicate. I'm feeling all kinds of stuff, but it has nothing to do with lies and limitation and pain and hurt and sorrow and despair. 
<sighs> Are you okay? There's a, there's a salvation to all these things. There's a saving of your soul, of your mind and your emotions to where you're living out of the true God-given motive in your life. And then everything that follows is in agreement to the wellspring inside called motive. If your motive is self-centered, you're very feeling-oriented and it's all about me, all about how I feel, all about what needs to change for me to be okay, all about who has to say what and not say what for me to be okay. But man, if you learn to Matthew 16 it and deny yourself in Matthew 6:33 it and seek ye first the kingdom of God, everything about your emotions begins to change. Because the motive in your life and the wellspring in your life is different now. You're not waking up for you. You're waking up for his great name. You're waking up to bring glory to the one that we say we love. You're waking up to shine. You're waking up to live in the spirit and walk in the spirit. To commune with him and know him and let people know him because you do. That motive would change how you respond on that morning. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God. All of a sudden, Holy Spirit, I appreciate you in my life. Man, probably shouldn't have drank so much right before bed, huh? Felt like I had to get up there and I fought it off. And you know the story. I didn't even sleep that much. Man, it don't mean a thing. This thing's trying to tell me my day and blah, 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 blah. And two weeks ago, you are in me and you're amazing. And God, I thank you. You're the lover of my soul. You're the strength of my body. You're my all in all. And I appreciate that today. I ain't got nothing to prove to you. I have the joy of becoming. And you're in my life empowering me. And now you're heading to the bathroom. You're freshening up. You're in the shower. And next thing you know, you don't even remember what it was like when you got out of bed. And you didn't call anybody for prayer. You just know him a little more than you did about 10 minutes ago. There's a problem when we just keep reaching out this way and don't establish this because you become so dependent on this. And then if you're calling brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, if they're not sharp, they become the prayer warrior in the church. They're the one that prays you through. They're the one that reads your mail. And if they're not really walking in total fellowship, now their identity is based on what they're doing and everybody's leaning on them and they're useful and needful. I'm not saying it has to be messed up, but it can get messed up quick. People do it to me a lot. They don't do it much anymore because I talk about it and people put everything on YouTube, so it's good. (laughs) Because people used to, everywhere I'd go to preach, people would just swarm me. Hey, can you pray for me? Can you lay hands on me? Can you just, I don't know, just pray this thing off of me. Just pray, I got fear, I got this, I got that, I got this. I don't pray for a lot of that. I'll say, well, do you really believe it's prayer? Well, let me ask you, what does that have anything to do with what you really believe? What about this? And then I'll share a couple truths based on what they're telling me. And they go, huh. Wow, I think, I think we just got this idea, you know, oh man, if they're walking with God, if they're walking with God, if she's walking with God, he just touched me. Ooh. Ooh. <sighs> Hi. <laughs> but if your belief system doesn't change, you'll be in the line the next time a speaker rolls into town. Why? Because life will keep speaking louder than truth and how you feel will sneak up on you. If you don't change what you see, you'll never change what you be. Are you with me? The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is single, just sees through truth. Just sees through him. The eye is single. Hey, you look good through the single eye. Look at that. It's not wide view lens, multiple choice, yell, yeah, but, well, you know. No, no, no. It's single eye just looks through truth, it looks through him. This stuff is so amazing, like, we've gotta learn what it means, I'm gonna talk about it for a little bit, and we'll just talk about like these sessions when you, wasn't the testimonies fun? Now look, there's always zeal to power and love, and everybody's like, Ron, a lot of you've been to power and love before, so it's not like, don't ever put on a false sense of something, man. Let it be your life. Let it be who you are. Don't just let the moment build. Don't just put on a, a, you know, an outreach jacket. And now you got two people zealous with you, so rah, we're going to win the city. You can put on a false sense of boldness, false sense of ministry identity, a false sense of a lot of things, 
when things are seemingly in the moment and they're, they're intentional ministry. This is a simple stepping stone into how it can be in your life, and Todd clearly explained that this morning, that you just pump gas. We just use the lunchtime and dinner time as a stepping stone into the things that are stirring. Yeah? But never, it's not a ministry thing, it's just you're, you're living in Jesus, so you love people, you recognize things and stuff, and you're aware and you're alert, and you just live this way. Yeah? So you're never looking for ministry. You're just living your life in Jesus. Yeah? And sometimes he highlights people, and sometimes you just know they already matter anyway. You say, well, I didn't really feel led. What a deception. Have you ever heard that? Well, I wasn't feeling led, brother. Well, the Bible already told you to go, and as you go. And Tom, where's Tom Rotola? He didn't mean the bathroom. Remember how he said that as you go? That was quick. That was funny. The girl was talking about in the bathroom. And he said, well, as you go. <laughs> no, as you go. <laughs> We're just, us guys are amazed by you women, how free you are. We're, we need freedom that you have in the bathroom. We don't have that freedom. Men, we don't have that freedom in the bathroom, do we? Like, they're like let's go to the bathroom together. <laughs> like they got potpourri in there. It's like a living room in the bathroom. I, I had to go in and turn the light out at church in the ladies' bathroom. I walked in. I thought I walked into somebody's like one room apartment. I was like, oh, and I went, I was, you should have seen me. I'm not joking. I was like, what? <laughs> they had decor and potpourri, they had a little chair and a cushiony thing. And I'm like, they hang out in here. Like they talk to the feet. Like, you don't do that in a men's room. You get in, you get out, and you look at the wall. That's what you do. Am I telling the truth? If, if, if you're a guy and you walk in a bathroom and you just look like this this way, everybody goes, and they push in closer. And there's pee fright the whole way up and down. Nobody can go. They're like, I think he's looking, dude. You want to mess people up, you just go in there and say, hey, guys, how's it going? Ah! It's so, I went into a bathroom one time and they were all lined up and there was the little kids one. I said, now, wouldn't this just be like Jesus to give me the little child? He said, unless you become like a little, they're like, he's talking in the men's room. It's so funny. <laughs> hey, you got a urinal? Some of them have little walls. The ones that don't have walls, it's serious. And, and I, am I telling the truth? You could be walking with your buddy into the men's room talking. As soon as you hit the door, the conversation stops. Am I telling the truth? Silent. You get in, you freeze, you stare at your block, and don't peek, and you get out of there. And as soon as you get outside, you're talking. I mean, we, we won't even go like this for the stalls. You know, you're walking, you're looking in cracks to see if you see a jacket or a foot or you're like, am I telling the truth? You ladies, I heard this. I heard that in the ladies' room, the children are crawling the stalls, go up the wrong set of legs. Your mommy's over there. It's amazing. We need your freedom, ladies. <laughs> One of these days, dude, we're going to be eating, Todd. I'm going to say, hey, buddy, let's go to the bathroom. We're going to try it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm going to build up to it. This conference is going to get me free. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why we come, man, just for freedom. It's for freedom that Christ made us free. It's for freedom, not debate. It's for freedom, not anger, frustration, and argument. It's for freedom. So if your life, and you know your life, if you would say your life isn't free, then you probably don't need prayer. You probably need more truth, because freedom is truth, and the absence of freedom is the absence of truth. 
The truth will make you free. It doesn't say ministry will make you free. Why do we always think we need more ministry? It's an absence of truth if there's an absence of freedom. So what I'm not seeing is taking advantage of my life. So in all you're getting, get understanding. Yeah? Come on, it's just simple. Okay, so here's the deal. This is what I want to really talk about. Uh, Todd was reading, where were you reading this morning? Romans 3. No, but you started in Romans 3. Let's go there, man, Romans 3. Let's see what he was reading. I'm going to check in on Todd and make sure he was reading the gospel. <laughs> ah, it's a good chapter. It's really good. No wonder you were in there. See, I color my Bible, so all this red is redemption, what I got through the blood, what I've become because of him. All this red... Oh, this red. Can you see all that red? Whew. It's beautiful. Blood red. I'm just going to start where it's red. It says in verse 21 of Romans 3, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law, apart from you earning, working for anything. See, your whole life you were you were really only acknowledged when you did something wrong. Most of the time, even when you did right, you were expected to, so nothing was said. So you were definitely brought out in this thing when you did wrong. A lot of people weren't even affirmed in their doing right because it was expected. We don't understand how subtle this stuff is. And when you did something wrong, you got hit for it, and it got exposed, and you got yelled for it at it, you know, depending on what family you grew up in. But a lot of people can relate to what I'm saying. That the only time you really got acknowledged in your doing is when you missed something you were supposed to or expected to do. And when you did that thing, nothing was said because it was expected. So there's a training from the time you, that you have to earn everything that you've got. That's why people quickly feel inadequate, unworthy, not worth right? Unworthy, not worth this. They can't hardly receive the message. It sounds too good to be true because they know their life. But he knows your created value, purpose, and destiny, and he knows why he paid a high price. Yeah? Gee, he wants to pull you out of that place and put his life in you and give you something brand new. So what Todd was saying this morning, I just applauded over and over. I was like, that was so solid. Like you can't add anything to it. It was that solid. So, so I just want to expound on this word righteousness because he mentioned it. So I'll just take my session and teach out what that actually means because see, you have to start where Jesus finished or you'll never run well. I'm going to say that again. If you don't start, if your starting point isn't where he finished, then you're not on that righteous road. You're, not, you're, going, to, you're going to try to earn something he already did. You're going to try to measure up to something he already measured you in. You're going to try to work hard to prove something that he already said through his cross. Like he already said, watch this, before you did one thing in the Lord at all, through his blood and through his resurrection, he already said, your life is worthy of this. It has nothing to do with what you did. It has to do with what you're created for. He knows our created value. He knows what he purchased. He didn't just buy it. See, one of the biggest stumbling blocks, honestly, and we made it the most awesome message is that it's all about going to heaven. It's, it's actually become one of the biggest stumbling blocks. That isn't the priority of the cross is to put new life inside of you. It's to transform you, to cause old things to die and put new things in you. We've made the whole goal of the cross to take me to heaven instead of heaven coming into me and living the life he intended from the beginning. So we're really distracted because we actually think we pray this prayer to go to heaven, but I'm the way I am and probably always going to be that way. And hopefully I'll shape up or brush up a little. It's disastrous. It's such a lie. On the night I got saved, it had nothing to do with going to heaven. I wasn't shunning hell and gaining heaven. I was dying to the lie. I was living daily so I could live every day for the rest of my life in a truth. 
And of course I'm going to live forever. That's a benefit. I'm one with the eternal one. He's never going to leave me or forsake me or change his mind about me. And he ain't never going to die, so I'm going to live with him forever. That's a good deal. But that's, if that's all your motivation is, life's going to catch up with you. People are going to hurt you and break your heart. And then you'll sell cheap when you're not for sale. And you'll say, well, what do you expect? If you went through that, brother, well, you don't know how that was. You don't know what I've been through. Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, you don't know what it was like. If you'd ever hear Jesus saying that, you might have an excuse. But you ain't never heard Jesus talk like that. You ain't never saw Jesus in mopey mood, like mopey mode, just sitting on the Mount of Olives, <laughs> rubbing his fingers through his beard. How do you know he had a beard? Because I have one. We're, we're one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, somebody's going to crucify me for that. Okay. You know, there's people just waiting for you to say something they don't agree with. There are people that do not know the Lord. Do you understand that Jesus talked to people for years and he's the truth and they killed him for what he said? That's scary. There was never anybody more right than Jesus, and they were so sure he was wrong, they killed him. <laughs> Why is it any different today? Scary. Could you picture Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, and he's just bummed, and Peter comes walking up. What is it, Lord? Hey, are you okay? I don't know, Peter. <laughs> but Lord, I've never quite seen you. Well, I've been thinking. <laughs> you know, Peter, I'm just going to bear my heart with you, man. I'm done always just saying I'm, a, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You know, I feel like I'm supposed to be because I'm supposed to be the example. And, but the truth is, man, these people, I mean, the more good I do, the worse they treat me, the more truth I share, the more they call it lies. I mean, I raised Lazarus and now they want to kill me. They're, they're just so twisted. I don't, they don't appreciate me. I feel so unloved. I mean, I don't even know if I want to go face them today. They're going to come and throng me again and they're going to listen. And then God, I don't even know why he does this, Lord. I don't know why you let me hear their thoughts. Their thoughts aren't cool. Like, I mean, I don't even really appreciate the gifting at this point because I can hardly handle all these things they're thinking. Like, you ought to be in my shoes, Peter, and see how I feel. You're doing good, and they call it bad. You're doing right, and they call it wrong. After a while, a guy can only take so much. So, Peter, I think the best thing you could do is just put your hand on my head and pray, man. Just pray. And then John comes walking up. John, come here. No, don't say a word. You're not laying on me today. I am laying on you. Please, John, just hold me, John. Just hold me. Don't say anything. Just hold me. That would be so weird. So that chapter's not in your Bible. Yay! And he said we're to follow him, not that. So watch this. He never taught us that. So where'd we learn it? He never taught us this, this example that we're all laughing at because we can relate to, the way we'd all be feeling if we were in his shoes in that day. But he never taught us that, and he's the good teacher, and he said, let no one on earth be your teacher. You have one teacher. He's the Christ. So if he never taught us that, where'd we learn everything we say we know? Sounds like we ought to put off the old and put on the new. Sounds like we ought to die to everything that ever was so we can live to the truth of who he is. Sounds like our lives are called to be transformed. Sounds like it's more than a confession and a position we take. Seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Woo! Maybe it's living every day in him and living by the Spirit. Maybe it's not a confession of position. Maybe it's where you're at in this earth. Maybe you're in the world, but you're not of the world. 
Maybe every day you wake up by the mercies of God, you present yourselves a living sacrifice acceptable unto him. It's your reasonable service of worship. And you are not conformed to this world, but transformed because you think like you never thought before. Yeah? I bet that's Christianity. Yeah. So 2 Peter 1 says, you have great and precious promises by which you partake of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. So what Jesus wants to do through the cross is put his life inside of you and his spirit inside of you, his ways inside of you, his motives inside of you, his heart inside of you. He doesn't want you to just pray for the sick. He wants you to take on his heart and nature. We say your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Hallowed be thy name. So we say no cancer in heaven, no cancer on earth. And we get revved up to pray against cancer because we have a dead giveaway that this ain't in heaven, it shouldn't be on earth. And faith rises and it's true. You go ahead and do that, right? But why does it always have to do with the power of God? Why isn't it always about the heart of God? There's no animosity in heaven. There's no jealousy. There's no hurt and brokenness. There's no regret. There's no despair in heaven. See, we've let life teach us who we are. And he said, no, I'm going to show you who you are. Now follow me. See, you can only find your identity through him. Anything else was going to be a lie. It'll sell you short. You can only find the truth about you through the truth. And he has a name. Yeah? Yeah? Come on, we were taught a language, we were taught emotions. You, you didn't, you, God did not give us the emotions we grew up with. Let's stop putting that on him. Well, God gave us emotions. No, he didn't. Adam gave you those emotions. They got all twisted up through separation from God. And Adam became self-centered. He was love a minute ago. Now he's cut off from love and in need of love. And he's self-centered. And he can't even take responsibility. He's blaming God, he's blaming the woman. the first effect of sin. Adam, did you eat the tree? I forbid you to eat. It was the woman you gave me. He couldn't say yes. But what he did say is if you wouldn't have gave me the woman, I probably wouldn't have ate the tree. You guys deal with it, but don't look at me. (laughs) Self-defense, self-protecting, self-justification, me, 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 self, self, self. Come on, you can't be a Christian for you. You can't be a Christian for blessing. You can't be a Christian for well-being. And that's not being taught in the church. Actually, it's being taught that's why you're a Christian, for him to fill all your vats and barns. And then the people who it ain't working out for that way are discouraged and wonder why God's failing them and they can't have a relationship because they have a genie who ain't granting no wishes. I am not a Christian for full vats and barns. I am a Christian to become the man he paid for that he intended from the beginning. And anything less is unacceptable because he purchased this and grace will take us there. Yeah? Come on. And if the way I'm thinking, the way I'm believing, the way I'm responding to others isn't producing life, then I'm not following him. If I'm just hurt and taken back and self-centered and, 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 and conscious of myself and low esteemed and all about me, I'm missing something. Because I'm to seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yeah, that means you wake up every day and think about how your life can bring him glory. How your life can rightly represent his name. Without striving, without pushing and shoving, just in relationship becoming that thing he paid for through the person of Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden your motives come into agreement and he aligns your eye to what he sees. And next thing you know, you're just living your life in Christ. Yeah? Come on, if we would focus there and stop. Now even there's, there's good folks trying to be good. That's a mistake. Enjoy being his. Wake up and be his. Wake up and already be loved. Wake up and be his favorite, even though I am. You can claim it if you want. Be his favorite. Yeah? 
Go wonder if Christians would get out of bed and stand up in the morning and they know they got to go to work and the boss has been acting out of control and their co-worker, he's been unfair and irrational and, and sometimes still tipsy from the night before and wonder if none of that would bother you and you'd see it as an honor to have the sphere of influence and step into the middle of all that and just shine. Instead of, God, I thought you loved me. Why didn't you change my boss by now? And if I have to work with Billy again without alcohol in his breath, I don't know what I've done wrong to deserve this hell and judgment. You need to get me a new job. God ain't even hearing your prayer because it ain't prayer. Those words are coming out of your mouth and they ain't even getting near the drywall, the ceiling, the drop... Yeah. <laughs> I put in four other applications and I haven't got one phone call. God, what have I done to deserve this? You need to show me favor. I can show you scriptures where I found favor in your sight. And if you'd be really listening, I forgave you. I wrote you in the book of life. I don't remember your sins anymore. I replaced your old nature with my nature. How about putting it on? <laughs> Come on, this is just a simple gospel. It's all about change. Anything that allows you to complain is a lie from hell. Satan would love to keep you believing you have rights when you already died to yourself. How can you deny yourself and be driven by so many rights? Well, I feel, well, I think, well, that hurt. Well, they shouldn't have. Well, how come? Will you? How do you deny yourself and all those things keep living? What does how you feel have anything to do with it? What you believe should trump how you feel in time should just overtake it and bring that thing into alignment. If you get tempted to feel sorry for yourself, you're a warning trap, hell itself. <laughs> Could you picture Jesus feeling sorry for himself? <laughs> What's the matter, Lord? Uh well, I gotta carry this cross now. I mean, I've done nothing wrong. I mean, Barabbas killed a man, I raised the dead. He's causing conspiracy. I'm trying to make peace here, something's confused. But I'll do it anyway, but it's not fair. <laughs> Could you picture Jesus on the cross in an analytical whirlwind moment of human reasoning? You bunch of idiots, look what you've done to me. If you haven't seen by now, you will never see. I've done nothing but good and this is the best you could do to me. Open up your eyes, you bunch of fools. We don't understand his language in the world we grew up in. He makes an amazing talk show. He's a victim and we're villains. But nobody wins in that scenario because the victims stay victims and the villains stay villains. But in the gospel, we get born again. And he comes with righteous judgment to swallow up all the wrong and give new identity to everyone involved. So this is what he says when he's on the cross. Forgive them, Father. They're blind and deceived and they don't know who they are, but we know, we know from the beginning. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And it would be awesome then if he would just look out into our eyes through that kind of teaching when you piece it all together and speak to our hearts and we could hear Jesus on the cross saying stuff like this. I know who you are, people, and you're worth every stripe on my back. You're worth every blow to my head. I've known you all from the beginning. We've been there from the beginning, me and the Father. And we've known you. We know why you're here and we know who you are and you're worth this price. Don't shy away. Draw unto me. Take it. Take it and run well. Let heaven come inside of you. Let my spirit come inside of you. You were not made for you. You were not made for the flesh. You were made for my kingdom and you were made for my glory and you were made for my great name. Don't be amazed that I would hang here and die. Of course I I would. It is worth it all. You're worth it all because I know who you are in me and I know who I am in you. So rise up and believe. Don't believe your feelings. Don't believe the world. Don't believe your former pains. Believe me, says the Lord. Wouldn't that be cool? That's what the gospel says. Yeah. 
See, the gospel isn't something to argue over. It's a life to become. And if you don't catch that, you'll get caught up in the arguments. It's not about sitting over coffee and debating your belief system. It's about walking in love towards the people all around you. Come on, be real with me. We've walked into settings, wondering if anybody noticed, wonder if anybody greet us. When I, I know people who left church and said, I ain't going back here, it wasn't too loving. And I say, it should have been, you were there. You missed your calling. We're always waiting for what somebody can do for us instead of how he can make us more like him. You with me? Come on, we can live this thing, man. I know this. I didn't live the past life that Todd lived, but I lived in myself in such a terrible way. I personally believe I was as selfish as any man that ever walked the earth. It's okay for me to have that belief. It's not condemnation. It's sobering. I saw the wretchedness of selfishness in my life. And the reason I got saved that night, I didn't ever want to live another day for me because I saw it was an absolute zero. And I cried. I was, I was horrified when I saw the selfish state of my heart. And I realized I was living at the expense of everyone in my life because it was all about me. I had zero capacity to love in selfishness. I had zero capacity to be sincere and genuinely care. I said what I needed to say. I did what I needed to do. But the ultimate result was for me. And it was the most horrific sight I ever had on June 9th of 1995. And I just cried and cried and said, my life is pitiful. It is one big, empty nothing. I can't live another day this way. I kept saying to the Lord, I have to be the most selfish man on the earth. I kept saying that over and over. And I believed it. I still do. I'm glad I believed it, because you know what he did? He 180'd that thing. So what I gave him, he took it and then gave me what was from the beginning. All of a sudden, I realized I died to live. I didn't ask Jesus into my heart. I didn't, if I die tonight, if I hit a tree when I leave the meeting, are you ready? Where will you go? That isn't how I got saved. Holy Spirit let me see in my heart, and there was no denial allowed. And it was the most horrifying sight of my life, the state of my heart. And I didn't want to be that one more day. And I said, Whoosh. and he said, Whoosh. and that's a big deal. A really big deal. Watch this. I was, I was separated from my wife for five months. We weren't communicating. I was already at an attorney and I was celebrating divorce. I already had plans to move in with a girl eight years younger than me and just start afresh. <laughs> Feed my flesh. And right in the middle of all that, Jesus came. I was celebrating that I was separated. I said to my wife, good, I'm glad you're finally there with me so we can move on. What did I waste 13 years of my life with you for? Arrogant, vanity, twisted deception. All at her expense. Yeah. Just think what that does to a woman. Talking like that. But for those 13 years on your nights off, you wanted her to go to bed with you. You wanted to have a marriage relationship. You wanted to, yeah. And then when it all falls apart, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. 30 minutes after my born again experience, my wife came to mind. It took 30 minutes because I was so overwhelmed by him. I, you have no idea. I was running around at work in the aisle, back and forth. I know I was pulling my hair. I was jumping. I was freaking out. I was going, you're real. You're real. You're really real. I was freaking out. And he left me there with him. Nobody came in. Nobody disturbed that moment. He just left me freak out. I'll never forget it. I had to work. I thought, I got to work, but you're real. Huh? And I, I get a case. You're so real. I put my case down. It was just, I was freaking out. 30 minutes in, you say, you're still freaking out, brother. <laughs> no, I calmed down just enough to communicate. <laughs> That's about all I've done. But 30 minutes in, 
I thought of my wife. I would have told you I hated her before work. I thought of my wife and I went, oh my goodness. She's such a peacemaker. She's tried so hard. She's just took this thing silently. Oh my goodness, I ran her out of gas. I pushed her over the edge. She has tried so hard. She has been so good to me. What happened? My eye changed when light came into me. When I died to self, I couldn't see through me anymore. All of a sudden, I'm looking through the Spirit of God, and all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I knew I loved. I was like, oh, and the more I thought about her, the more I wanted to hug her. The more I thought about her, the more I cried, the more I wanted to tell her I'm sorry. All of a sudden, I was blind, but now I see. It was amazing. Now, my wife wasn't having this kind of encounter. My wife was sitting at home with a 26-year-old that used to have Harleys pull up at her driveway, multiple Harleys. They'd stay all weekend. I, was, I used to call her a biker chick, kind of degrade her and get cynical. It was just because I didn't have a Harley. I was jealous. I was wishing I had a Harley. I remember being degenerate like that. I remember her. she would come out and do her garden and her wet flowers on purpose. She'd wear the stringiest bikini she could, and she'd put her butt to the road, and she'd pull her weeds. And I remember looking out my garage going, oh, my goodness. She was my wife's counselor teaching my wife how to live and have fun and make the most of the moment. So while I'm getting delivered, she's at home hurt by me because I outweighed her revelation of Jesus. I outweighed the love. So she's smoking a joint. It's just the craziest story. My wife, if you knew my wife, it's mind boggling. She's sitting smoking, passing a a doobie. (laughs) Jackie, you know my wife. She's sitting there smoking pot. And they got a little mixed drink on the picnic table. She's, she's sipping, they're talking. And she says, it'd be just like my husband to come home one of these days and say, I found the Lord. When she said that, She told me all this later because she was so, mm, mm. when she said that, while she's saying that, I'm at work getting absolutely undone by Jesus. So guess what the, guess, guess what her little counselor said? She said, well, don't you listen and don't you ever go back. You know how men are. They don't even realize they lost a good thing till they lost a good thing. Don't you ever reduce yourself and go back. You make him pay. You make him live without you now. She's like, yeah. (laughs) I ring the phone. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just, God's real. (laughs) It wasn't insecurity. It wasn't, please come back to me. I just rang the phone. I said, hey. She said, what do you want? I said, I'm not even sure. I'm just overwhelmed. I said, Kim, it's amazing. God is so real. And she went, click. We were trying to live in the same house so we didn't blow all our little bit of finances. So when we divorced, there wasn't nothing. So we were sleeping in separate rooms, but we wouldn't talk. It was horrible. You put your children in that, it's all because your hearts are hard. It's not even about anymore who's right and wrong. It's just your hearts are hard. You've allowed each other to decide each other. See, you can't sell me cheap anymore. Nobody's going to talk me out of this thing. I've been saved too long. I've seen too much as a pastor. We're letting a person decide who we are and how we are, and the trouble is their name's not Jesus. So we're making people Lord, singing he's Lord and proving he's not. We're letting what we've been through matter more than what he's been through. We're drawing identity from stuff instead of him. And we're saying, well, you you wouldn't be talking like that if you lived in my home, brother. See, you're already snared. And in your mind, your home is a justifiable circumstance to not pursue his image and walk in the spirit. So your tomorrow is going to always be yesterday. 
until you find that to change. Well, you don't know what they put me through. Well, I wonder if Jesus had that beef. Wonder if the cross time came and he said, nope, enough is enough. You have no idea what they put me through. See, if you can't find it in his life, don't give permission for it in your life. And if you didn't learn it from him, then you didn't learn it at all. Are you with me? Because I went home that night and she's quiet, timid. She's always in her room with the door closed. She, we ain't talking. And that night when I walked in, she was waiting for me in the living room. And that is not my wife. My wife is timid, quiet. She, I don't even know where the button was, but poof, poof, she had, I think her claws were that long. She was like, wow. If, if I wasn't born again a couple hours ago, I would have probably been very scared. I walked in and she told me how much of a fool I was. Why? Because she's hurt. She doesn't understand. You're a fool, damn molar. If you think you're going to pull this, you're just trying to get the family to side with you to come out smelling like a rose and make me look like the witch. Do you see what's happening? It's all about ourselves, isn't it? It's all about how we appear to others, all about what everybody thinks. So all of a sudden, you're a cat in a corner. And I'm standing there and I'm like, I feel so sorry, I wanna tell her, but she's gonna claw my eyes out if I try to say I'm sorry. And I didn't feel like I needed to right then. I was like, now ain't the time. I'm just thinking, God, you're real, whoa. And she's talking and I couldn't wait to go talk to the Lord in my bedroom. And I just said, look, I understand, you know, I get, I'm you know, sorry the best I can say. But, and I just took off, I went to the bedroom. And she, ah. I remember days being in my bedroom just praying. I would just come out to go to work. I remember one day I come to the door. I opened the door and she was standing right outside the door because she was listening. Now, I'm not dishing on my wife. I'm showing you what pain can do to a woman. That She's amazing. My wife, she, I watch her fellowship with God every day. My wife's doing so good. She has a heart for people. She cries. When somebody calls me and says something, she says, what's going on? And I'll tell her. She'll just start crying and she'll just go pray. She's just the sweetest thing, and she's ministering to some ladies that she used to work with, staying in touch, doing visit stuff. My wife's a very good girl, but man, back then, she didn't know what she sees now. All she saw was the wretched husband she was married to. So she let where I wasn't decide where she was. So every day, she was a product of my dysfunction. And now I'm changed and she's mad because you have to make up for it, we think. Well, I'll never forget what you put me through. If God took that initiative, we're all done. See, do you see, we did not get this language from the Lord. This thing is all about becoming love and being changed. But she was standing outside my door and it was, I still remember it. It's a great testimony to just share how things can change and how you can respond. Because here's the deal, guys, I'm gonna be straight with you. If I'm doing all this just to get my marriage back and I'm insecure or I'm ill-motived, why would I expect Holy Spirit to be involved? Some of us are so insecure, we're like just trying to get our spouse to change their mind. And the more insecure you get, the more you solidify they don't want to change their mind. <laughs> I've had people come to me as a you gotta pray for me, you gotta pray for my spouse to come home. And I'm like, maybe that's not our priority prayer right now. What do you mean they need to be with me? We're supposed to be married. How about if we pray Christ gets formed in you? And how about we just start praying that you grow up into him and live secure in Christ and get this first. And then as God sees who he is in your life, he can entrust who he is in you and he has something to bring them back to. So he ain't just bringing them back to you. That would be a bummer. Just bringing them back to you. Whoa. <laughs> She's standing outside the door. She had her little arms crossed. Now listen to the analogy. Listen to analytical thinking. You make me so angry. You stand in there and you pray like you're some holy man. I don't think so. You live like the devil for 13 years and put me and those kids through hell. And now you're in there like you know God. And I'm like... What do I say? I guess you could say, 
well, Kim, you know, if you'd really guard your heart and protect your heart and not let me decide your life, but you'd really be in relationship with God, you'd probably be praying and seeking to be able to see that I am really transformed and I am the man of your dreams in the spirit. And you probably... <laughs> no, you don't say a word to her. You lived so messed up. You're not trying to change her. You're being changed. And you're going to let your change begin to speak into her without you even realizing it or trying it because my goal isn't her changing. I want to become the man he paid for, period. It's not what I can get out of God. It's how I can be more like him. That's the goal. So seven weeks went by. She fought me tooth and nail. She went out of her way. You can just stretch your mind. She went out of her way to make me angry, break my heart, and get me to prove to her conscience that I was a hypocrite. She just was looking for a reaction on me. She, she could go, aha, and then relieve her conscience, which was screaming. Because she knew the Lord. I didn't. When I met her, she was six months saved, looking for change in her life. Sadly enough, at that time, she met me. Wrong person at the time. Shouldn't even been together, really, honestly, if we get right down to it. God's just merciful, and he makes things work together for the good. But we had no business being together. I told her I was a Christian. The whole nine months we were engaged, all he had to do was take one look at me for one day and know I wasn't a Christian. I tried to sleep with her constantly. I violated her conscience and made her cry over and over and over and just kept telling her I love her. <laughs> Yeah, but now I do love her. And she can't see it because she's hurt. And pain manipulates you. And unforgiveness manipulates you. You're not made to carry that stuff. It's not normal to heaven. Unforgiveness will mold you and shape you into something you're not. Unresolved conflicts, hurt and pain will, will, will mold you and shape you into something you're not. It'll cause you to do things you would never do if you were free and living in the spirit. It'll generate desires of survival instinct and they'll be real to you and you'll live for the moment instead of live for him. She fought me for seven weeks to break my heart, but I didn't have a heart to break. Nobody was counseling me. I didn't have one counselor in my life. I had nobody in my life, nobody. I would just spend time in my bedroom in my Bible and Jesus was showing me if I didn't have love, I had nothing and he was showing me what it looked like. And you know, we always say about Jesus healing the brokenhearted and somehow we get the idea that we're all supposed to have broken hearts all the time and then he heals them. Come on, he's not super glue. He doesn't piece it back together and then you break it and he pieces it and break it. No, no, he heals the brokenhearted. He gives you a perspective to where your heart's not vulnerable anymore. I wonder if we teach people they don't have to be broken. Look, in seven weeks, I probably had a basis in marriage to say I was broken. If somebody's going out of their way to hurt you, you probably think you have a reason to be hurt. But Jesus taught me I never have a reason for that, so I couldn't even see hurt. I couldn't even see pain. I'm seven weeks old in the Lord, and my heart was that protected in the truth. That all I could do was weep for her because I knew I heard her. And all I could do was weep for her because I knew it wasn't who she was. She was deceived because she was hurt. And I just wanted the honor of loving her for the first time in my life. Come on, if this isn't legit, you could just say, oh, well, I'll love somebody else. No, nope, I'm married to her. I want to love her for the first time in my life. I'll finally see her value. I would love, I would love to walk that out. Yeah? You say, yeah, but she, yeah, but she, nothing. God never said your name, yeah, but he, or yeah, but. Whoever came to the altar sincere and came for repentance and God just showed up on a throne sitting there. Oh, it's you. I'll tell you, you've been bugging me for a long time, friend. I always thought I'd be happy on the day you finally came to this altar, but I'll tell you what, I'm not so sure anymore. It's good I don't slumber because you'd have kept me up many a night. 
Remember six months ago, I really moved your heart? You had the greatest opportunity to be saved that night, and you pushed it off, you shunned me, you kicked against the bricks, you went out and caused six more months of hell and pain. And now your back's against the wall, and you want to come here and cry and say you're sorry? I don't even know if I believe you. In fact, I don't even know if we have a future. You say, God would never do that. Why? Because he's God. No, because he's love. And he made you for his image. And Christ is the wisdom of God for men now. And Jesus said, follow me. Follow my example. So I guess if God would never say that, we should never say that. I guess if you can't see it in him, you shouldn't see it in us. You know how you hurt and pain and things we've justified in our lives because we haven't known him like we sing? Come on, let's grow up into him in all things. Not just provision and protection. Character and heart and the manifestation of love. Yeah? yeah? My wife snuck in the back door one day. She wanted to catch me in an improper situation. She was looking for justification. So she left for the whole weekend. She left for the whole weekend. She left me there with the kids. I was honored. My kids were clinging to me. I'm not joking, man. My boy was five. I would walk through the living room, Father, I just thank you. And, I just, and he'd just be following me going. <laughs> and I'd just be in, God, I thank you for my family. I thank you for my children. I'd lay my hand on his head, five years old. <laughs> totally into the carpet. And I'd just keep walking, just keep praying. He'd get back up after a while and he'd just follow daddy. And God, I just thank you. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. For one whole year, I lined my 10, my five-year-old, and my wife up in front of the bed before I left for work and just worshiped God and laid hands on them. They're just laying over top of each other, and Jesus just in the room. And I, that's how I left for work for a whole year. My boy, four days, three days into this whole thing, he's just sitting in his toy box. And I'm like, he ain't even saying nothing I say when I pray in tongues. Like he was, he was a cup bubbling over. He's five years old and he's just sitting there praying in tongues, playing with his toys. You say, well now brother, that's theologically flawed. I woke up Monday morning, 10 hours, no. I woke up, yeah, eight, nine hours saved, praying in tongues, sobbing and crying and praying in tongues. Nobody laid hands on me. Nobody taught me anything. I just woke up praying in tongues. What do you do with that? Say I had an encounter with a lying spirit and all these 23 years I've been living in a deception. <sighs> no, I'm going to go with the fruit that's before the Lord. I'm going to go with lives that are changed. I'm going to go with things that I've seen and heard in him. My wife walks in six hours after she left. She waited six hours and she tiptoed in the back door. She's trying to catch me sprawled on the couch, screaming at the kids, watching some trash. Anything she could find to relieve her conscience and go, ha ha. And guess what she caught me doing? I was sitting Indian style in my living room. I had the book of Psalms open and I was teaching my 10 and five year old the beauty of worshiping God. Yeah. She's peeking around the corner. And I saw movement and I looked and there was her face. And I said, hey, did you forget something? She said, I'm fine. And she stormed upstairs. And then she came back down and took off. She said she yelled at God the whole way to her sister's house. Why would you do this now? All the time I prayed. Oh, 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 oh. She was just freaking out. How could you? Because she couldn't get away from it. She knew I was changed. So she said, well, even if he's changed, it's too late now. We learned a lot of language on the earth, didn't we? We sure learned how to be selfish. Jesus said, if anyone come after me, let him first deny himself. He didn't say prayer, prayer to go to heaven. He said, deny yourself. It's the biggest problem in our lives. I'm not a politician and I'm not a philosopher and I'm certainly not the sharpest man on the planet, but I believe I got this one right. President isn't the problem. It's not ISIS. It's not racial conflict. It's every day, every day men wake up and live for themselves when they're made for God's image. 
It's where every argument comes from. It's where all the hatred exists. It's where all the tit for tat. It's where everything that doesn't produce life and focus on the kingdom lives. Man living for himself. Paul said, don't be wise in your own opinion. And we have opinions a dime a dozen. James said, slow to anger, quick to listen, slow to anger, uh, quick to listen and slow to speak. What are we? Don't want to hear it. Got a whole lot to say and I'm really ticked off. Slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to listen. That's James. That's the Christian. What have all of us, most all of us been our whole lives? Ticked off, don't want to hear it, got a whole lot to say. Guess what love does? Lays down its life for another. Guess what we've all grown up doing? Living at the expense of each other. You say, how? Bad attitudes, putting pressure on each other. You're in a family of three, four, and you cop an attitude that puts pressure on your other three, and they have to respond to you. You're living at their expense. You're not adding life. You're drawing from it. You're taking from it. You be careful, young people, just copping an attitude, whatever, and just shutting your door and avoiding and putting people under pressure, parents getting ticked off and scolding your children because they've crossed your line. You're not supposed to have a line. You don't say, Billy, get to your room. I told you once, I told you, but mom, but dad, just get to your room. Don't do that to Billy. You walk Billy in his room and you sit down and you weep with Billy. And you tell him why you're pulling some things and disciplining some things because his life is a whole lot more than what he's given himself to. And you make sure Billy knows when you're done with him that you did it for Billy. And that if he continues to live this way, these kind of things are going to cause pain and limitations in his life. And you're trying to teach him at a young age because I love you, boy. And then you wrap your arms around him and you pray with him while you're disciplining him. And you walk out of his room. So Billy knows you're not mad at him even a little bit. That you actually believe higher a Billy than he's given himself. Yeah? You got great opportunities. Some, you got homemakers here, some of you women. How many women would say you're a homemaker? You're like, you're just keeping down the fort, man. You're holding down the fort, caring for the kids, washing up them clothes. Yeah? <laughs> Todd, Todd said, you're waving your hand for Jackie. Listen, how do you do all things to the glory of God? Whether you eat, whether you drink, do it all under the glory of God. How is that possible? How does a guy in Dallas in the summer, and he's a roofer, go to work every day and do his work to the glory of God when it's 100 degrees plus on that roof? And you already know what it was like the last two days, and now you're on hump day, and you got two more days before you even have two days of the break. You recognize that your life is for the kingdom and you stay thankful so you receive grace in all things. And you don't go to work with an attitude. You don't grumble. You don't complain. You stay in fellowship with God and you do what you do. And even if you see it as a season and you're looking for a transition of jobs while you're in that transition, do what you're doing with all your heart to the Lord. Yeah? So you set an example to men. If you're a homemaker and you're at home, please don't get caught doing this. Like, guys, don't be driving to work. Man, I can't believe I got to go to the grindstone again. God, you got to get me out of this crazy job. I don't know if I can take it much more. And I can't stand the language. If I hear one more F-bomb today, come on. Stop it. You're just, you're just getting in a weird place, man. You come home and you're burned out and you're expecting your spouse to understand, well, they're just cursing all day and they're tearing each other up and they're cynical. How much can I take? Like, I wouldn't even know how to be like, oh, <laughs> I'd be like, so where's Jesus in anything you're saying? Like, why did you go to work for them to treat you the way you were hoping? <laughs> like, since when did your preference become Lord? <clears throat> I thought you went to work to shine. What's the matter what they were saying? It should make your heart more merciful towards them. Your homemaker, please don't get caught doing this. You're at the wash and you look down and there's this big load of wash and you just did three loads yesterday. And you're like, you would think I'm married to this wash machine. It just seems like all I do is wash, 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 wash. And you pull it out and you said, I think that man wore this shirt for 25 minutes. I don't even think, oh, chew, oh, Johnny, didn't I tell you a hundred times to never do your stuff inside out? That's it. I'm just washing it inside out. You can do it yourself.
But you just left from your little tea time with your little prayer group girls and you just pray and blessings over your family, <laughs> blessings over the children. Bless my husband, Lord. And now you're at the washer cursing everybody. You say, Johnny, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times, that boy will just never get it. He'll just never get it. Well, what am I supposed to do, Dan? You pick up that little inside out shirt and you kind of chuckle because it's inside out for sure. And you say, oh, that boy, I know you're going to turn things for such an amazing way. Like this boy, sometimes, Lord, you've been growing me. I used to let simple things frustrate me like this, but now I just feel like all I can do is prophesy over his life. God, just like I'm turning this shirt inside out and around, you're turning little Johnny inside out and around, and you just move and shock. And then you get your husband's shirt. Next thing you know, you're done all the washing. You're looking for more. That wash thing coming on you. You're just ready to speak over your family. See? You up there in the kitchen, cook, cook, cook. All I do is cook. We should just order it out. I don't even want to cook tonight. Some of you women are like, amen. <laughs> Go ahead and cook and eat out. But what I'm saying is watch your attitude. Make sure you don't get tricked into self-centered things and do what you do to the glory of God. I'm telling you, you find so much grace. You get at that washer, you get in your car and go to work and you start blessing your family and thanking God that you're in the position you're in. It's called laying down your life, not living for yourself. Come on, I'm telling you, it'll just, grace will flood your heart. You will have a view of your family that is second to none. You will value little Johnny even when his shirt's inside out. You, you'll find your daughter, she changed like three times. And you'll be like, I don't even know she had this on. You're like, Sniffing. Because he just changed three times looking in the mirror. He just threw it in the wash. Man, if, if something like that is going to mess up your day, you are a sitting duck. Satan's sitting back on. <laughs> and then you're at church. Holy, holy. And he's sitting there going, yeah, right. I turned to Romans 3 and Todd read it this morning in his bedroom. We probably ought to just check it out. Verse 21. No, we're going there. I feel the doubt and unbelief. We're pressing through the unbelief. We're pressing through it. I, I've, I've created the unbelief, so I've got to press through it. <laughs> hey, you know? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're going to read this. Romans 3, verse 21. But now, but now. Whew, Man, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, it's amazing. The strength of the gospel is the righteous judgment of God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, he made us right in his sight. The word actually carries the definition of innocent and holy. He who knew no sin was made to be sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That means the righteous judgment and expression of being judged right by God through Jesus Christ. It carries the word innocent and holy. First Peter 2, let me quote it for you. He bore your sin and my sin in his body on a tree. And we, yeah, that's exactly right. We're like, yeah. But watch this, that we having died to sin, that means it's identity, it's consciousness, it's memory, it's desires, it's identity. See, there's a response of faith in the believer. Jesus did something amazing. You can scream about it for the rest of your life, but he's saying, hey, you better put it on. You better open it up. You better unwrap that thing. If, if righteousness is a gift, you better open it up. And then don't just say, oh, well, that ain't quite my size. That ain't quite my color. I don't know if that's going to fit. Put the thing on. It's made for you. 
Yeah? And don't look at the gift and say, oh, you shouldn't have. Because he'll say, oh, yes, I should have because I've known you from the beginning. And the one I know ain't the one I've been seeing all these years. It's time to die to the old so you can live to the new. You put it on. It's called righteousness. Righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. See, it's apart from the law. So, so, so it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. In the, in the, in the, in the days of the law, animals had to die. Innocent little spotless lambs. They would sell them at markets. I mean, these people had to like kill stuff. They would split the little doves open and like atone for sins. Come on. We're right. Apart from our works, we found rest through God, right? Or through Jesus with God. I, I, I make jokes about it. I'm like, could you, aren't you thankful? Let's just stop living by the law. Because if you live by the law, then you need to start doing something with your little cat and your puppy and your parakeet. You get off the computer and little Hammy's in trouble. He's over there in the wheel and he sees you in the computer and his eye starts twitching. No, no. And then you get off your computer. And there you go down into the basement. <laughs> and little Hammy. All of a sudden the parakeet ain't even singing no more. Because he says, oh, they're under the law. Come on, if you're going to live under works in the law, then you probably ought to just start doing something with your pets. You're not under the law. You've been made right in the sight of God. So what do you do if you sin? First John 2, you have an advocate, Jesus, the righteous. And he'll plead mercy over your sins, so you run to him, you don't run from him. You run to him, you don't run from him. And his righteous plea will bring righteousness and keep righteousness over your life. The design isn't to enable you to keep on sinning. It's so that you see the goodness of God in that judgment of righteousness and that he believes better about you and knows you have a greater purpose and potential and he sees you apart from your ability to sin and he sees you for purpose in him. It's the whole goal, that the goodness of God would lead you to change, that you would actually wake up one day in truth and go, oh my goodness, I wasn't made for this. I was made for this. And all of a sudden you step out and step in. And all of a sudden, the gospel itself has raised your identity. Not your actions, not your own fruit bearing. The gospel itself has raised your identity and low esteem has become healthy esteem. And all of a sudden, you see the value of your life in him and now you live up to what you see rather than follow that old thing. Are you with me? And that way, it's not by works, it's by faith. And guess who gets all the glory? And when you see your life changing like that, you know it's changed because you live with you. And all of a sudden, your conscience goes free. And all of a sudden, you're not living in secrets. And all of a sudden, you can preach all this stuff because it's your life and your reality. And you compel people with these truths. And you go to bed tonight, and your conscience is clear. And you actually go to sleep feeling good about yourself and God. It's a real good place to live. Sure beats secrets when there are none. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God or fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the restoration, the bringing back to original value that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a mercy for our sins. That's what that word propitiation means. Mercy seat. By his blood through, here's your part, here's my part, through what? Through faith. To demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. It's just so amazing. To demonstrate at this present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Come on, that says it all right there. If, if you and I believe that, bam, never again, guilt, condemnation, shame. It'll end struggles. You wake up and you're right with him. You present yourself a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God. You do a Romans 6, you wake up and you present yourself as members to righteousness, working its fruit and producing its fruit to holiness. 
I've done this as a pastor for a long time. When I'd counsel people, I'd ask people what their prayer life looks like. I would ask people how they talk to God when they're alone. And a lot of people look at you funny. They don't have a fellowship time with God. They just have a prayer list. I'm not saying the prayer list is wrong, but to not have a fellowship with God, you'll never get to know him. You're just always keeping the hopeful meter of what you need. If you don't get alone with him, you'll never get to know him. If you don't commune with him, how will he ever reveal himself to your heart? If you don't seek him, how will you find him? If you don't draw near, you with me? I've learned this. Lots of Christians, as I was growing up in the Lord and, and pastoring and leading and stuff, and I, I know it's changing rapidly today, but there's still many people. Never talk to the Lord when they're alone and initiate communion with him where they just acknowledge his love for them. Thank you that you see me pure in your sight. I so appreciate you making me clean through the blood. I've talked to countless people that never even thought that way when they were alone, let alone talk that way. And that's a giveaway right there. But we're trying harder. We're trying to be better. And that's why we're sure we're failing. I'm telling you guys, this gospel is our only answer. It's our only true hope. He's not a way, and he's not a good choice to try. He's the way. Yeah? And there's something about you starting where he finished. There's something about you every day waking up and not being afraid of being in denial, but actually waking up every morning and saying, you know what? Man, you made me holy, blameless, and above reproach in your sight. You made me worthy of housing your Holy Spirit. You passed over all the sins committed, separating them as far as east and the west, and you made me right in your sight. Thank you for making me worthy of your life in me, of your love. I appreciate you, Father. That would be an amazing way to live. Yeah? I'm just telling you straight up, if you don't start where he finished, you'll never run well. If he rules his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness, and the strength of the kingdom is righteousness, then you probably ought to stand in it if he paid for it. Because as a man thinketh, so he is. The way you see yourself is what you'll produce. The Lord wants to fine tune and brighten the lamp of your body and it's your perspective, even on your own life. Wonder if the blood is enough, wonder if the work is finished. Wonder if there's nothing I can do to become more righteous wonder if he did that all. I wonder if my place is to, by faith, put that robe on and never take it off. I wonder if. The beauty about understanding what I'm saying isn't self-intended. It's big picture intended. The more you see God sees you this way, the more you understand it's how he sees every man. And it'll begin to teach your heart how to not give up on people, get frustrated at people, judge people, or be critical to people. Because you understand that in your weaknesses, he came and made you strong. And that when you were missing it, he treated you as if you made it. And all of a sudden, what he did for you and what he did in you begins to translate this way. And all of a sudden, you're not just forgiven. You've become forgiveness. You didn't just obtain mercy. You've become merciful. He didn't just make peace with you. You've become a peacemaker. And all of a sudden, the gospel is multiplying in as many as believe. This thing is not a confession. It's an expression. He transforms our lives. Why don't you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray over you. You proud of me, Tom, that I ended so early? Whereas he ain't even ready, is he? You, you closing out? Look at that. They told me 420. It's 417. I gave them three minutes back. That's amazing. We can live this life, guys. It's by simple faith. The first expression of righteousness you'll see in your Bible, the first expression is already in Genesis 3. God revealed his righteousness in Genesis 3. When he came to Adam and Eve, and what did he do? He took off their fig leaves, 
They were covering their sin, but who knows it wasn't covered. If he left them fig leaves on them, every day they woke up, what are they thinking of when they see them fig leaves? The day they sinned and missed God. The day they threw it all away. And God doesn't want to leave them sin conscious. Guess what he does? He takes off their fig leaves and he puts on animal skins made with his own hands. Now we understand that you can find the blood covenant there and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. I get it. But we miss righteousness there. See, we say, well, animals had to die. It was the first sign of blood covenant stuff and animals shedding their blood to remit sin and no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. I get it, not making light of it. It's just not my point right now. Watch. If he leaves the fig leaves on them, all they're aware of, their identity is riddled with the day they missed it. But if he prophesies over them and tells them there's a seed coming through the woman who's going to crush the head of the enemy... And then he puts animal skins on them. Every day they wake up and see them skins, what are they aware of? The day God promised a hope, a future, salvation. Right? So Jesus didn't even come yet. Jesus didn't even shed his blood. And God's already saying, I don't want you focused on what you did wrong. I want you focused on how I see you and the hope you have right in front of you. So he took off the lie and put on a higher truth. Are you getting this? And it was a way of God saying, I love you. You have a higher creative value than what you performed. I'm going to bring out the best in you. If you don't put that thing on, how will you ever manifest that truth? I'm just telling you, as you stand there humbly waiting to pray, let your days of guilt, condemnation, shame be over. Let the days of yell, but be over. Let the days of who? Me be over. Yes, you. And you begin to thank God that he loves you and nothing can change that but you. He'll still love you, but he won't be receiving it. See, it's one thing if I look at you, man, and say, hey, God really loves you. I'm always right, but it's another thing if he's being loved by God. That's our highest goal. Why don't you lift your hands to heaven with me, would you? Father, we just receive you this morning. Would you, from your heart, every hand that's raised, every person that's participating, from your heart, would you just thank God right now, from your heart, you can whisper it out, you can say it out, just say, thank you for loving me. Thank you that truly, through this gospel, I'm clean in your sight. You value me, you love me, you've washed me. You came to live inside of me, and you came to transform my life. I yield to you, you're the great potter, and I say yes to your love, yes to your mercy, yes to wholeness. Come on, just receive it, put it on. Wow, some of you say this, some of you need to say this, thank you that I'm clean. No matter where I've been, no matter what was ever done, you have me standing here before you, clean. You've changed my heart. You've changed my life, and you've took everything away that was not of you. Thanks for making me brand new. I receive your love. I receive you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to live in you all the days of my life. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. If you enjoyed this message, please visit danmolerarchive.com to find over 2,500 more messages from Dan, all organized by category, playlist, and search. Enjoy.